I'm David Waterhouse, Senior Curator of Natural History and Geology at Norfolk Museum Service, and I'd virtually like to welcome you to Norwich. Home to two cathedrals. Nice. Norwich Market. It's been here for nearly 900 years. I mean, it's closed now, it's nearly seven o'clock at night, but you get the idea. And of course, Norwich Castle Museum and Art Gallery. Although shrouded in mystery, we do know that it was built by someone called Norman at around 11 o'clock in the morning. It'd be nice when it's finished. But what about the really important stuff? Natural history. Well, we've got loads of that here too. And they trusted me to look after it all on my own. In fact, Norfolk Museum Service holds around one and a half million natural history and geology specimens, and both collections have been designated by Arts Council England as being of both national and international importance. Now, I may not know too much about Norman history, and I'm not the best tour guide, but I do know about natural sciences. It was these collections that formed the bulk of the material acquired by the original Norwich Museum when it was formed in 1825. Although they're mainly of East Anglian origin, the collections do incorporate historic material from elsewhere in Britain, Europe and the rest of the world. We've all had to change the way in which we work in museums since March 2020. Like other museums, we've installed well-thought-out one-way systems and regular hand-sanitising stations throughout. Cases have been moved to allow extra space and push buttons and handling areas have been covered up. Staff have had to apply for special permission to work on site, only allowed in for essential collections at risk work and projects related directly to reopening. But Norwich Castle Museum is also in the middle of a £13.5 million redevelopment project entitled The Royal Palace Reborn. It's a major National Lottery Heritage Fund supported project that will reinstate the medieval floors and rooms in the Norwich Castle Keep and also create a new visitor entrance, cafe and shop. It has brought up its own unique issues and obstacles to overcome. During the course of this short tour, I'll be focusing on some of the changes we've had to make in the face of both a pandemic and a major capital project. One of the changes made as a result of the Castle Keep redevelopment and closure of the main entrance is that the natural history galleries are now the first thing that visitors see when entering the museum. A temporary front desk has been set up within the British Bird Gallery and visitors are directed here to pay or show their museum pass to enter. A formerly rather nondescript fire exit and corridor is now the main entrance to the largest museum in Norfolk. Greeting the visitor would have been a tired case displaying traces and tracks of native mammals, last updated in the 1960s. I felt that this case needed a complete refresh, and we had relatively recently had some of our amazing Blaschke glass models conserved for temporary exhibitions. Blaschka models are of course very rare and precious, and are an important part of science and art history. Despite having only 20 individual models, they're so rare and delicate that Norwich Castle actually has one of the most important Blaschka collections outside of the National Museums in the UK. So how do you go about curating an exhibition case in the middle of a pandemic and national lockdown? The answer is with difficulty, but with the right team in place, it's certainly possible. In normal circumstances, we'd all get together around a table with the models and come up with a plan to display them based on my curator's display brief. Of course, during a pandemic, this isn't possible, so I had to curate it remotely. Luckily, all the models had previously been photographed, 
which certainly is not true for all of the collections I look after. As we have full access to the museum's computer drives from home, I was able to look up each specimen remotely and get an idea of exactly what we had and how big they were, etc. After stopping to look at the Blaschka case, the new pandemic one-way system takes us through into the British Bird Gallery, and our bird collection includes many examples of fine Victorian taxidermy by locally significant taxidermists. As you'd imagine, among them are several historically important specimens, including many first records for Britain. A unique group of great bustards, of course formerly extinct in this country, but now successfully introduced into Wiltshire, and examples of almost all of the other species that have ever occurred in Norfolk can be viewed in this gallery at Norwich Castle Museum. In total, 318 different species are on show, and I know because I wrote all of the labels and painted the background scenes in this sort of 3D bird guide. This gallery has been there since 1894, when Norwich Castle first opened as a museum, and has changed surprisingly little since then, being a significant resource in a mainly rural and birdwatching mad county such as Norfolk. Next, we travel through to the Ted Ellis Norfolk Room, named in honour of someone who formerly had my job as Curator of Natural History at Norwich Castle Museum. Local naturalist, author, journalist and broadcaster Edward Ellis. This nature diorama room was funded by public subscription during the 1930s and is probably the first example of a natural history diorama gallery in Europe. The six scenes show Norfolk's varied habitats and environments and include handmade by Ted, wax models, taxidermy and dried plants. They still fascinate visitors today with the skilful way in which the background paintings blend with the specimens in the foreground. Although much of the Norfolk countryside has changed dramatically since these displays were constructed, some wild places do remain where these scenes can still be viewed, places which give Norfolk its special character. Ted Ellis was employed by the Castle Museum from 1928 to 1956 and was a well-loved local naturalist whose enthusiasm and commitment to the Norfolk Room project ensured its success. In 1987, just over a year after he died, the gallery was renamed the Ted Ellis Norfolk Room to commemorate all that Ted did for the museum and natural history in Norfolk. The original idea for creating dioramas in Norwich was to make exhibits of such beauty and interest as will attract wide attention and stimulate the desire to protect and preserve the wildlife which still survives in Norfolk. In 2009, the room was enhanced by adding in subtle birdsong and sounds of the Norfolk countryside, something that we're sure Ted Ellis and his colleagues would have done in 1932 if they could have. Now I'm told that Norwich Castle Museum holds world-class collections of archaeology, fine and decorative art, costumes, military and social history. But if you're anything like me, this holds limited appeal. So let's get back to the good stuff and take you straight through to the Natural History Gallery, officially the most visited gallery within Norfolk Museum Service's 10 public sites. This exhibition space was designed to represent diverse, disparate and internationally important biological and geological collections, numbering some 1.5 million individual specimens, in 2009, the 1960s-designed Mammal Gallery was completely changed, transforming it into the flagship Natural History Gallery for the County of Norfolk, truly reflecting and providing an insight into these varied and important collections. Notable among the mammals still on display here are a group of antelope, 
including Niall Letchway, mounted by Roland Ward and on display in the central cases. Other mammal specimens resulting from Victorian expeditions include a polar bear shot by Sir Savile Crossley in 1897, today used as an important reminder of how formerly common animals are dwindling fast due to climate change and habitat loss. Incidentally, this is one of the few places where you can see penguins and polar bears in one place. It was designed as an ends-of-the-earth case, incorporating collections from both poles. When designing and building this gallery, the curators, Dr Tony Irwin, then Senior Curator of Natural History, and me, worked very closely with our in-house designers. The old gallery contained specimens divided into continents which they originally came from, but gave no unique information that couldn't be found in an encyclopedia or from the internet. The new gallery was to tell the story of these amazing creatures, plants, objects and collectors. For example, our red kangaroo used to sit in the Australia case with basic information on what kangaroos eat and where they live. However, we knew that this kangaroo was one of the first boxing kangaroos in Europe, and this unique story had to be told instead, with a pair of vintage boxing gloves alongside. After a theme or story was decided on for each case, something which I'm sure was in Tony Owen's mind for some 30 years or so, we designed the cases in perhaps an unusual but very practical way. To ensure the gallery stayed open for as long as possible before install, a mock-up case was made in one of our stores, and objects and specimens were physically placed inside to ensure a perfect fit. After all, with arms, legs, beaks, tails and wings sticking out at all sorts of angles, it's very difficult to do using a computer alone. This ensures a very fast install, as we'd done it all before, making sure that everything fitted and there were no nasty surprises. One of the rules we had when designing the gallery was that no idea was too silly or outlandish to mention, and every suggestion would be considered with the same seriousness. Many of these unusual concepts became incorporated into the final gallery, and one was that there would be Easter eggs or secret hidden features in some of the cases, so that our many museum pass holders could come back time and time again and discover new clandestine jokes and visual puns. You'll have to visit yourself to find them all, but an octopus tentacle about to snatch a fish from the display a snail slowly crawling away from its object number, and a wind-up tin toy bird in the birdcase are just a few of them. Another edict during the design and build process for this gallery was that if we weren't having fun making it, then the public wouldn't have fun visiting it. This led to a relaxed but creative environment, and the feedback from the 10 years or so the gallery's been open now is that thankfully people are still loving it. From the start, we wanted to layer the information within the gallery, as different people have very different ways of taking in information. At the very basic level, we wanted something aesthetically pleasing, fun and awe-inspiring. The next level for the casual visitor would be a simple did you know fact in each case. After that, a main case label would impart a little more information. The object and specimen labels would give more technical info, including accession numbers and scientific names. Finally, a computer, tours and talks and handling material would give more in-depth information, including sensory info, to visitors who wanted to find out even more. But what was an asset in normal times turned out to be a hindrance during the times when we were allowed to be open during the pandemic. Anything touchable had to be covered up to stop the spread of COVID-19. Luckily, a local school's art project was in need of a gallery space to showcase the students' work around hand-built nests, 
excuse the pun, but this really did kill two birds with one stone. As the graphics were supplied to us, all we needed to do was to print them and fit them over the handling areas. Happy children, and happy health and safety officers. But even before the pandemic, museums and society's priorities were changing, and a decade-old gallery still has to try and move with the times. This gallery was purposefully designed to last with minimal change for another 40 years or so. But our interactions with the public have altered as important issues have been brought to the fore. Taboo tours were designed to give a history of the slightly more uncomfortable side of our interactions with the natural world, both in the past as well as today. For example, the plight of sharks being fished for their fins is highlighted by looking at a hammerhead shark that was caught off Great Yarmouth in the 1820s. And I developed a queer nature tour with our learning department, picking up on LGBTQ plus issues and stories from the natural world, rather than tracing the individual histories of collectors or curators of the past, when in reality very little is known about their personal lives in this way. Very much inspired by the work done by Mark Carnell, curator at Oxford University Museum of Natural History, and Jack Ashby, assistant director at the Museum of Zoology, University of Cambridge, these tours help visitors to understand gender-bending roles in spotted hyena society, both through taxidermy and fossilised remains discovered in Norfolk. And of course, an LGBTQ plus tour in a natural history gallery just wouldn't be complete without mentioning penguins. Another important display in Norwich Castle's natural history gallery is the Love of Butterflies case, containing the Fountain Nimi butterfly collection. This collection resulted from a lifetime of accumulation by Norwich-born Margaret Fountain and her companion Khalil Nimi. She travelled all over the world from 1892 to 1940, breeding and collecting butterflies. The collection contains around 22,000 butterflies, most of which were bred from eggs or caterpillars and are therefore in exceptionally fine condition. She would often rear a whole brood into adulthood, keeping just one or two, then releasing hundreds back into the wild each time. In addition to the butterfly collection, Fountain bequeathed a sealed box, which, rather mysteriously, was to remain unopened until 1978. When it was opened, it was found to contain 12 journals detailing her life from 1878, when she was 15, until her death in the Caribbean in 1940. Extracts from the journals have been published, generating considerable interest in the collection and the journals. Visitors from all over the world have come to study them, and the journals have been the subjects of several academic theses, as well as a stage play. The most recent inquiries about Margaret and her travels have been for a possible ballet, and even for a New York drag act. The combination of a scientifically important collection and Margaret Fountain's sociologically significant literature is not unique, but there are few naturalists, let alone groundbreaking female Victorian naturalists, who have collected in and written about 60 countries on six continents over 50 years. A truly remarkable woman. If you'd like to go on your own tour of Norwich Castle's natural history galleries, then you can use Google Maps and search for Norwich Castle. Drop the little yellow chap into the castle and look around at your own leisure. When the pandemic is finally over and we can all get back to some sort of normality, do drop by and see us. You never know, Norwich might even just surprise you. So there you have it, just a little whistle-stop tour of the Natural History Galleries at Norwich Castle Museum and Art Galleries. Oh, what was this? What's it, there's a lot going on?
Thank you so much, David. I'm sure uh, you're seeing a lot of comments in there for your, the love of your uh, presentation skills there. It's definitely a career in BBC4 TV presenting, presenting I think, there for you. Um, yeah, so we've covered a huge amount of ground there. Um, got a few questions coming in. The first, first I'd like to ask is, are there the changes that um, you're forced to make during the pandemic that you're thinking of keeping hold of uh, kind of when we return to normal? Um, not really, because <laughs> um, I, I suppose most of them were, were covering up um, handling things so it'd be great to, to get those back w one of the the kind of ideologies we had when we redid the natural history gallery in 2009 was you know we didn't want too many buttons and things that could break and we all know that you know something breaks and then it just stays like that for ages so we wanted real specimens to handle um so as i said in the video it was a uh, positive before and now it's a <laughs> it's a negative um unfortunately um the building work's going to carry on in the castle keep the norman keep so the natural history gallery will be the entrance until well i don't know when a couple more years um possibly so um i think from that point of view it's um you know putting natural history center stage um so i guess that will that'll carry on after after COVID, if it ever ends. On the, on the topic of things you can't touch, um, <laughs> the, the question in from Dakshka, uh, they saw some Blaschke glass models at Cardiff Museum in 2018. Do you know how these, uh, were, how were Blaschke models generally acquired and distributed among the museums that have them now? Yeah, we worked. We worked with the the guys at Cardiff. Um, I'm Gavva Cymru, um on an exhibition. Was it called Curiosity? A few years ago, and we we borrowed some some of their specimens, and we had some of ours on display. But um, basically, they were bought. I mean, they, these things were were um, sold to museums and universities for for teaching, um, because these um, kind of soft bodied marine creatures just couldn't be stored um easily so so they were studied and uh, um and, and created and we're not quite sure how how they made a lot of them but yeah they were bought i need to do a bit more research into when um we we got ours at, at norwich castle um and, and and when yeah when they were bought whether somebody else bought them and then donated them um so that's something yeah i'd really like to look look more into wonderful um so Patty has asked, are, are the Ellis dioramas painted from specific locations mm. and, or do they just represent general Norfolk scenes? Yeah. So it's a mixture. So some are very definitely um, uh, a specific scenes. So we've got one of Braden Water, this wonderful estuary by Great Yarmouth, um, which is full of waterfowl. Um, and then others are kind of a mi mismatch of, uh, of different environments. So I think the North Norfolk diorama, one of the very long ones showing sand dunes, um, is, is a few places kind of put put into one. Um, and then we've got the Norfolk Loke, um, and that's a, a kind of Norfolk word, which kind of means a, um, a, a lane which has um, got vegetation either side growing, growing up alongside it. And there's loads of those dotted around dotted around Norfolk um, so that's a very very general one um, and then we've got the Yare Valley as well the River Yare is a chalk river that flows through Norfolk and through 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 Norwich um, and that's quite a specific one and also a specific time of year so we've got snow um, down there that's a winter scene as well so yeah but a bit of a mixture um, really. And you said that did you say that you painted the backdrop to the British Bird Gallery yourself? Yeah. How, British... how did you go about that? Is, is that similar... <laughs> well, um, we, we put that out to tender. So they were just plain black backgrounds. Um, we put it out to tender and all of the, honestly, all these graphic design companies and, and things, they wanted so much information from me. And some were just saying, can you do, give us, like, can you draw us some black and white versions? It's like, what, we're going to pay you all this money for you to colour in my black and white drawings. So I just said, oh, well, I'll just do it. So, yeah, I just got my watercolours out and then we scanned them in and had them blown up. Um, so all of the backgrounds are... Um, the right habitats for for that group of birds um, in front of them. That's just the easiest way, easiest way of doing it, really. Wonderful! Another string to your bow, obviously presenting <laughs> and uh, painting. Um, wonderful. Yeah. Um, question from Paolo: How uh, how much did the redisplay cost? And I was, 
I was trying to remember this. Um, I th uh, does seventy thousand pounds sound wildly too much? No. <laughs> yeah, it was. No, impression. I think it was eighty. I think it was eighty. I think it was eighty thousand pounds because all the cases were al already there. We got some grants um, from things like Wolfson Foundation and the Friends of uh, Norwich Museum. Um, and yeah, it was all kind of done on a shoestring, really. Um, I famously did an exhibition. It was just two cases once for four pound ninety nine. So um, <laughs> that was just me with some. I had to buy some acrylic paint because we'd run out. But um, yeah, it was. It was all. I mean, I think art, art, temporary art exhibitions cost more than that sometimes, don't they? So yeah, Tony Irwin and I are quite. Yeah, keep our purse strings quite, <laughs> quite tight. <laughs> on the topic of budget, Joe Hatton's asked if you um, had budget and capacity to um, carry out visitor evaluation on the gallery over the last 10 or so years. Um, so what were the kind of key findings or insights? Yeah, so I mean we were part of the, the Natska, um, you know, uh, kind of uh, visitor survey that you, you were kind of leading, Jack, um, but that was more just counting people sort of coming in and, and and that's what made us officially the most visited gallery um in in norfolk um so so we're a mixed mixed museum with you know all that norman stuff and, and all the boring other things obviously we're just interested in natural history um but the natural history gallery is the most visited um but but to be honest we haven't done much official kind of um filling in evaluations it's all been um kind of uh through just kind of face-to-face -face feedback um and on tours and things so i try and do as much interaction with with um visitors as i as i can um and just seeing what what people like really um so yeah nothing kind of written down perhaps we should do perhaps we should do that when we're back up and running properly post-covid um, and you mentioned in the tour that you're covering topics uh, kind of Troubling histories, the LGBTQ plus stories. Um, Jen Gallagher was asked, uh, "Do you have any plans for bringing in any stories relating to decolonizing collections?" Yeah, absolutely, and that's kind of next, next, next on the list. Um, so, uh, yeah, looking, looking into that. We touched on it a little bit in in Taboo, um, but that that's something very much that that I I want to do. Um, it's quite it's quite difficult i find to kind of look in look into those histories i mean just just to find information i mean rather than difficult to to, to kind of deal with um but that's certainly something i want to do um also in temporary exhibitions as well so i'm working on one um called fossil giants at the moment you might not think you can bring in kind of uh, issues uh, important issues there but just looking at race um with that because in Norfolk we have this um, amazing archaeological record. We have four different species of human that we've got evidence for. It's the only county in, in, in Great Britain to have that. Um, and just putting that in context, you know, in the past there were different human species coexisting on the planet. You know, people get hung up about race, this kind of construct of race today, um, kind of pales into into uh, kind of um, in, in consequence when we look at different different species in, in the past um, and kind of looking on that and hopefully bringing, bringing people to, together a bit more as one species, I suppose, if that's not too, too cheesy. Oh, wonderful. That's a great place to end this session. Um, so I want to say a huge thank you to David Waterhouse and also Patty Woodfinkel and JP Cavagelli from our, our last tour.